Welcome back to the channel and welcome back to another edition of the Spurs Chat Podcast, where, of course, we are all smiling again. What a result. We will be talking about, of course, the trip to Villa Park, Aston Villa nil, Tottenham Hotspur 4. Now, I would just like to say that we are live on YouTube, on X and Facebook, so please do get in, involved. Let us know your thoughts on today's win. It is a huge statement win, in my opinion. We are now only two points away from the top four. Of course, Aston Villa in fourth place. Spurs remain fifth. Uh, but we do have a game in hand over Villa. Of course, Madison put Spurs 1-0 up after 50 minutes. Johnson put Spurs 2-0 up three minutes later. Hunmin Son with a third on 91 minutes. And Timo Werner coming off the sub bench and scoring for us in the 94th minute. John McGinn, of course, received a red on 65 minutes. And it would be fair to say that we should dedicate this episode or this podcast to Matty Cash. Um, I've got three very special guests to talk about today's game. We've got Jar Wobble back with us, of course, musician. He's got a new book out as well. Jar, how are you? Um, well, pathetically, it, my life is is basically related to the fortunes of Tottenham Hotspur, which is very yep. sad at 65 years of age. But I'm now, I could walk on out at the moment, Chris, you know. And, I, and before the game, I wasn't at all confident, by the way. You know, so that was incredible. We started off in the second half where we left off in the first half against them at the game at our place. Remember, we played them off the park for, that, for most of the first half, and um, I, I don't, I don't know if we've played played Ange ball since that half against Villa. Ben Zaku had come back, got injured. He, he was running the game at the point. Matty Cash steamed in on him, got away with it, and as he'd done with uh, Doherty all them years ago. But anyway. No point to be bitter. Revenge is a dish best served cold. And that's icy, mate. What's happening today with Matty Cash and all that. That's it. So I'm very happy. I'm, I could walk on out. We will certainly get into all the football. Um, now, let me just say happy Mother's Day to uh, all of the mothers out there. And let me also say that the last Mother's Day weekend, that was when Conte was ranting and raving at Southampton. How... You know, what changes in a year? Incredible. Um, yeah. Also back with us is channel regular Craig Dearman. Craig, how are you? I'm all good, Chris. I'm all good. I'm still, still to be honest, catching up from on sleep from Friday night shenanigans at, um, at Peterborough. Uh, but yeah, yeah, it, it was a, you know, it was a cold, wet morning out watching my son play football this morning. And uh, their team won and come home and watch Scott. Tottenham and Spurs absolutely trounce Villa. So it's been a really good day so far. Absolutely great second half. Um, so good. I mean, it's amazing, like you say, what can happen in a year, where we were this time last year to where we were this year or where we are this year. Two points behind Villa game in hand. It's all good. And also back with us is Italian journalist Simone DeLumo. Simone, glad to be, uh, glad to have you here. How are you? I'm fine, mate. I'm fine. Delighted to be back on the show. As always, even more this time with this incredible and uh, incredible performance all around the all around the pitch. So delighted for the three points. Simone, let's start the show with you. Let's get your thoughts on today's game because, as I mentioned there, this is a huge statement win. It is really in Tottenham's hands now to finish in the top four because, of course, we do have that game in hand over Aston Villa, but. You know, I was saying exactly the same at half time as uh, as what Jar has just said there. When was the last time we saw Ange ball? We certainly saw it in that second half. Yeah, definitely massive, massive win. It was uh, a sort of a top four final because uh, if Tottenham had lost the game, it was uh, it was over. We need to be honest, guys. We need to be honest because the fixtures on April will be absolutely atrocious because we've got to play Liverpool, Man City, Arsenal at home, and even uh, Chelsea away and Newcastle away. So the fixtures are what, it, what uh, are going to be extremely tough, but of course it's a statement win. It's a statement win, and uh, I'd love to say that time is gentleman in this case because after after uh, the lost that loss, the third one in a row uh, at the lane on uh, on November was very very hard to take. Uh, uh, delighted for the performance, and uh, let me add. Uh, Chris, that uh, I strongly believe in football in the in tradition in history. Spurs have got a huge tradition at Villa Park. It's a stadium, it's a ground where, uh, in the last ten years, results were absolutely brilliant. Is the is the maybe for nil? The first one was uh, Boxing Day in 2013 when Gareth Bale scored that the hat trick. 
we, we won the same uh, the same result uh, two years ago under Antonio Conte. So massive game, massive uh, massive win. Spurs are there, and they will try to finish into the top four until the very end. John, let's come to you. Um, James Madison has just uh, said we had a game plan and we came away with the three points. We blew them away. Um, Pape Matasar, who I thought was absolutely outstanding today at Villa Park, he said, what a result, let's keep going. And by the way, this is Emery's joint he heaviest home defeat as a manager in his career. Um, Jar, I was very similar to you before the game. I was a little bit worried about this one. But as Madison said there, we blew them away today. What are your thoughts on the game? Well, I don't know if they did anything subtle. When you're at the game, you can see all the positions. So watching on telly, I didn't see that we did anything too different to what we've been doing or trying to do all season. You know, um, I thought Madison, obviously, he was most effective. He's been for, for weeks and weeks. He was fantastic. Uh, we First half, we didn't really do much in their last third, but really dominated the ball. I think we had... I'd be interested in over stats for the possession just in that first half, but we just seemed very, very um, steady, good defending. It wasn't. Misuma gave the ball away a couple of times, but apart from that, it's pretty good. Kulu, I was moaning as a, about, about him at half time, but yep. he, he, I think he was the player that put Sar through for the first goal. He pressed for um, to, to, to for the second one as well, I think. It was his pressing. Obviously, Ange, because even against Villa, uh, against Palace the other week, he doesn't sub him, does he? He always keeps Kulu on. He obviously really trusts him in some way. But in the first half, everything was coming down that left side. Johnson was looking very bright. But we, we just weren't doing much in the last third. Neither were they really. They looked, they looked to me like that a little bit more of a threat than us in the last third with that first half with very limited possession. It looked like Embry was sitting back, very compact, um, the way they did against us at White Hart Lane, at, at Tottenham Stadium, and the way a lot of teams play against us, the way Wolves play against us. You look very deep and you wait for us to make a mistake. You wait for us to overcommit. But we didn't. We, we were very sensible today. And in that second half, it's just you know wonderful pressing, wonderful possession football. Um, I didn't see any subtlety particularly. I don't know if they did any particular thing tactically. It looked to me like they got between the lines, left, right and centre, got Madison on the ball all the time. Son suddenly became a threat. It was it, terrific. You know, really good attacking football and um, could have been a wee bit more clinical. You know, when we were two up, you know, we, we missed a couple of good, good opportunities. One when we had a real overload in the box and you've got to do better than that at this level. But that's a little bit of a moan, but you can't argue at 4-0 away at Villa Park. No, you can't. No, you can't moan at 4-0. Um, Joe, I'll answer your question. Stephen uh, gave us the stat here. 63% for us in the first half. Um, but possession overall in the game, we had 70% to Villa's 30%. Shots, Villa had 10 to our 9. Shots on target, Villa only had 1 um, to our 5. Corners, they had 6 to our 4. Uh, fouls, Villa 11. Spurs 15. Um, John, let me ask, was it a really good performance from Spurs in that second half or were Villa just off it today or is it a little bit of both? No, I think Tottenham just steamrolled them. So they just didn't have a way. Tottenham were just so intense all over the park. I can't think of a one-on-one -on -one that we lost, you know, one-on-one -on -one all over the pitch. It was great. Even when Mickey van der Ven, we would have all been very concerned about him going off, you know. But now this Dragusin geezer comes on, got a very un a yellow card he didn't deserve. He's more moving away from the ball, whereas Villa, through the game, was standing over our free kicks and getting away with it. So it was unlucky. And you wonder if that had cost him dear with a, a, a silly challenge to get end up getting a second yellow. But he slotted in. Had marvellous room to come in like that. Such a, that's going to boost his confidence along. A long way, Romero. We don't even we don't even comment that Romero doesn't get yellow cards anymore. He didn't today, did he? Unless I'm missing something. I don't think he got one. Um, so I'm, I did have a couple of go and make a couple of tea breaks. You know what I mean? But um, all good. So I I don't think yeah, it'd be churlish to sort of say, oh, well, Villa just weren't really at it. They were well fired up today. They were well fired up. They just got beat. We were like a boxer that was just had too many combinations, powerful combinations. We were moving well. 
and they couldn't live with us today was one of them that's how it was they thought they could play the canny game sit deep and pick us off but then when you do that you risk getting overrun as they were and we did to teams what city have been doing for years today intense winning the ball back in their third and a constant threat the movement was wonderful in the second half you know they were coming from outside to win Werner came on and looked great. Look at him. It's supposedly a waste of money. Two goals and a couple of assists already. He's starting to, to bed in. So, no, it, uh, it'd be crazy to say old Villa weren't really at it. And what happened when the game today, you can't say, oh, that's a bit unfortunate. That, you know, it was a bad tackle. And they've got away with two terrible tackles against us in games where we've been. They, they obviously, the, the Villa, think they can bully us a little bit, you know. So, I'm, I'm more than anything, I'm happy to see Emery finally come unstuck against us in such a big way, you know, not just because of the Arsenal connection, because you're the typical canny, you know, kind of manager playing his careful football. And it's a great in indictment of, of, of Ange Ball. You know, it really just says, yeah, Ange Ball is something. Because I, I was starting to have a few doubts this last few weeks. You know, I, I went to the uh, 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 game away to Everton. And you think, well, this is saying old Tottenham crumbling on a cold day up in the northwest. If I had a pound note for every time I'd see that, I'd have about 346 quid, you know. So um, I'm, I'm very happy. How can you not be happy with that? And, and you've got your centre forwards injured, you know, as well. You're doing yeah. it with him. So great stuff. When you say about Romero and the yellow cars, I'm sure that the betting companies have done pretty well today. I'm sure there would have been a lot of people uh, betting on Romero getting a yellow or a red today, uh, certainly with Matty Cash on the pitch. Um, Jar, um, just very quickly, who was your man of the match today? M mine was Saar, by the way. I thought Saar was incredible. He's looking such a player. You know, he's got something of the Vieira about him, but maybe just a bit faster, you know. He, 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 he's a monster in midfield. He's defensively great. He gets up and down and that ball in. It was a really tough call, you know, but I think I'd give it to Saar because, I mean, that 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 ball in, that set us off. I mean, it was you can't defend a goal like that. And Madison made it look easy as well. That was the important goal. So I think I'd give it to Saar, but, I mean, I thought Romero was immense. I thought he was fantastic. I thought Johnson was very, very good. Son kind of had a good second half. Um, Kulu had a good second half. But, yeah, I guess overall it's out. Sarah and Madison. I thought Madison controlled the tempo of the game today in the second half and had a decent first half. Great to see him playing his football in that last third, not in the first third, you know. Mm. So, um, I, I'd go with Sarah as well, yeah. Craig, let's come to you. Let's get your thoughts on the game and uh, who was your man of the match? Um, yeah, I was, I, was, I was a bit frustrated in the first half, to be honest with you, probably like most of us, you know, a lot, a lot of possession, a lot of probing, a lot of pushing, but not many shots, uh, and, and basically akin to what we've seen in the last few weeks. But the second half performance was was outstanding. Um, I suppose it's like Anne says, you know, it doesn't really matter when, and he doesn't care when we score as long as we score. Um, so you know, he doesn't seem too concerned about it. So as I said the other week, football's ninety plus minutes. Doesn't matter when we score, and we scored four in the second half. So, so it was all good. Uh, great performance. Man of the match for me was Brennan Johnson, actually, purely on the fact that I thought it was his best game in a Spurs shirt. I thought he was absolutely uh, brilliant. Um, went on, he was actually running at defenders, which I wanted to see him do, which I've been asking for him to do. He's in the right place to score his goal. Um, having said that, a lot of candidates for man of the match, absolutely. So, I was, was, was brilliant today. I thought Doggy made some good probing runs. Before he went off, Van der Ven, the game was superb. And just just come out and said he said he doesn't seem to think that's too significant. The injury, he wasn't sure, but he doesn't think it's too significant. So um, it was obviously something he was feeling at half time. So they obviously didn't want to take any risks with him, so they took him off. But um, yeah, all in all, a good, well, a fantastic Spurs performance. Uh, Four 0 is a bit of a statement. That's really done wonders for our goal difference as well. We're now two ahead of Villa, I believe, in goal difference. Um, as I said, two behind them with a game in hand, albeit against Chelsea at the bridge. And we know how that's gone in previous seasons, but hopefully this year we can do something there. That would be brilliant, wouldn't it, to uh, to get one over Chelsea. And as Jar said, a massive, massive April coming up. Um, and it's in our hands. That, that That's the key thing. Champions League football is in our hands for the first time in a little while. So, yeah, a really good afternoon. 
Craig, after today and after today's performance and result, how confident are you that Spurs will finish in the top four? Because I know we've got some very difficult games coming up uh, from now until the end of the season. The likes of Liverpool away, Arsenal at home, City as well, um, at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. But when you look at Aston Villa's uh, running, you know, I, I know there's that old cliche, there's no easy games in the Premier League, but they do have some very difficult games coming up as well. Yeah, I, I'm going to stick to what I've said for the last couple of months. I think we're going to nick fourth. Um, I see no reason to disbelieve that. I think we've got all our players back now. We seem to be starting to play and ball again. We was only doing it in periods the last few weeks, but today I saw it a lot more. We looked in control today against the team that are there or thereabouts us, you know, on our level, if you like. And I don't, I don't know they played on Thursday night, but they've been brilliant all season, Villa. Um, we were head and shoulders above them today. And I think Villa are perhaps now, I mean, we can hope that they're going to be going through the sticky patch that we went through. So I think if we can leapfrog Villa and get above them, I don't think they'll catch us up, but we've got to get there first. So it, as you say, it's a long way to go yet, but I, I, I'm going to stick my neck out and say, I still think we can get fourth and not have to worry about the European coefficient taking down to fifth. Um, I think it's definitely achievable. For me, that's the highest we can get. I know a few people are saying, oh, we could get third. I don't think that's in our range at all. But I think if we can get fourth this season, I don't think that's a brilliant um, bit of advancement for the club under Ange. And then we can relax and see what happens over the summer as to bring in other players, strengthen the team and get out some of the other players that, that are not in these plans. So it's it's amazing what one result does for you. Um, I say another win, but you can see things going in the right direction. We've just got to hope we can push on from this and carry on this good momentum, keep players fit and uh, pray for a bit of luck. Absolutely. Um, not every Premier League team are in action next weekend, but Aston Villa are and Spurs are. Uh, we travel to Fulham, of course, next Saturday. Um, Aston Villa travel away to West Ham United. Uh, so those will be certainly interesting games. Simone, um, how... How confident are you now that Spurs can get that top four finish and we will be hearing that Champions League music next season? Just like you said before, just like I said at the start of the show, of course, the fixture will be very, very tough in, on, uh, on April. But just like you said, even Villa has got, have got some very, very difficult, uh, difficult game. The key, guys, is going to be the persistence, the consistency. You need to be consistent in the, um, in the, in the next couple of months the very end of the of the season and we are talking about a very very young team very very young team we're trying to to build something under big edge we're trying to build foundations we're, we're trying to build a new way of playing football so it's not gonna be always easy uh, let's see let's see let's go step by step next saturday will be will be full on way then you've got a couple of games at the start of April where you can make points because, of course, you've got West Ham away, but there is Luton at home and maybe Nottingham Forest at home. Uh, and then it's going to start the very, very difficult uh, uh, segment of, uh, of April with the big teams coming up at the lane. So we'll see what's going to happen. John, let's come to you. Um, of course, Ange Postacoglu made three changes today. Um, the starting eleven today was as follows. Vicario in goal, uh, Pedro Poro, Romero, Van der Ven, Udogi, Basuma, Saar, Madison, Kulisevsky, Son and Johnson. Uh, the nine subs today, Hoybier, Dragusin, Emerson Royale, Werner, Lo Celso, Benzinker, Davis, Austin and Scarlett. Um, it's quite difficult at the moment, Jar, isn't it? Uh, predicting Ange Postacoglu's starting eleven because... In your opinion, were there, were there any surprises for you on that start 11? I think some people felt that Timo Werner should have been in the in the start 11 today. What are your thoughts? Well, this is the Lisa, what point I made about Kulisevsi earlier. And obviously really likes him um, because he keeps him. He doesn't sub him hardly. I do know his stats are very impressive. I think at one point he ran more than uh, any other player in the Premier League, I think, you know. Um and so he obviously really rates him. I think someone like Werner, in a game like that, I can see the logic of you want to bring him on when legs are getting a bit tired, the game's getting a bit stretched, and you've got more space to run into behind. And and so it comes to pass. So that makes sense. 
OK, Saar starts over Benzakir, but that would have been the case against Palace if Saar wasn't have it, didn't have a back niggle. So he had a he had some kind of back problem, not a major problem, just a small little issue, a muscular problem, apparently. So no real surprises there. Porro's fit again, right? So he starts, you know. Um, and what a huge difference having him and a dogey. They were, they, I think the Wolves game, I think City have just scored, by the way. I think that the... Um, that was the. They were bigger misses than I even expected them to be because it's like you're losing two creative midfielders, you know, when you lose those two. So I don't think there's any real surprises. I think everybody's not realizing that Bissouma and Saar are his favourite um, midfield coupling. Those two, you know, that makes sense. And Poro and Udogi are the two, the only two fullbacks at the club who can play that inverted role to so well, you know. Somebody earlier said, who come up on the screen, I saw, that a dogie was their man in a match. And actually, that's not a bad call, you know. So it's a very soft goal, by the way, City, from a corner. Strange, you know, no one at the near post. It looks like stones to me. Centre-half's got oh, yes. just side footed it in. Anyway, there you go. I'll tell you what, Joy, you know that when Spurs have had a good day, when, when people are shouting out a whole host of names as man yeah. of the match, uh, incredible, really. Um, Brennan Johnson, um, for you, Jar, what, what did you make of his performance today? Because he has been criticised, heavily criticised by a number of Spurs fans in recent months. But I just see a player like Brennan Johnson and Timo Werner, for for, um, for that matter. I see that every week you're going to get that little bit more out of each of them under Ange. Do you agree? Well, you know, I saw some of the criticism for Johnson, and you just. But then again, I can remember where I used to well sit, stand. We all used to stand at the old White Hart Lane, but a lot of the people around me really slagging um, Kyle Walker off, who's now playing for City, doing very well. Thank you very much. The last few years, I remember he was people. You know, your dog shit, all go and all that rubbish, and you're thinking, you know, a real up and coming young, good young player, you know. Um, and, and so it's come to pass, you know. So Johnson's really can play wide. I wasn't sure about him playing on the left, but there was that game, I think I went to Palace, wasn't it? He, he, he played on the left and did well. He, he'd done that lovely sort of little nodded pass for Kate, for, um, for, for, for Son in that game. And I, I, I worried about him starting to down the left, but I thought we had Matty Cash on toast. The Cash looked well worried dealing with him, you know. So he's a young player, you know, he's... And all down to confidence. We, you know, Tottenham fans are some of the most gruesome in the world. I think for giving players abuse. I remember Terry Venables. Your shit, Venables. You know, um, you know, he, he took stick. Martin Peters took a, a lot. I've seen so many. You like our favourites. That Garley. I think we talked to the Egyptian fella who had his teeth knocked out. Um, I think it was at Portsmouth. So at half time, they went out to find his teeth. Not many of us have had their teeth kicked out of them. I've known one or two up in Stoke back in the day in the 70s, fans, but that's another issue. But then he, t- he took his shirt off. Do you remember in that he got the, he got subbed as a sub, took his shirt off and everyone turned against him. I think it was Garley and maybe it was it, one of the Egyptians, I think. And everyone forgot just a few weeks earlier, he'd had his teeth kicked out and played on. You know, so Tottenham fans, you know, some of the biggest sort of whingers at times and, you know, and that's where someone like Ange, you need a strong manager who's just unyielding. You know, we do it his way. His pressers are really so, you know, resolute. He doesn't give anything away. It's just his way. He doesn't yield. And I think for the, that reflects with the players that he's 100% behind them. He's not going to listen to anybody. He's not going to, you know, take any easy options in, in regard to curry and favour with the fans. You know, he's a tough Aussie. And that's right, because Johnson today, he's starting to find the back of the net and he's obviously doing what Ange wants and Ange is starting to really like him and he played well on the left today. I prefer him on the right generally because I think he'll get more goals from the right and he gets a good ball in from the right as well. But you can't criticise that today. Was, what I liked about him is that aggressively goes for the defender to take him on, whereas Kulu I find just a little bit frustrating because he's like a little bit at times a bread and butter winger. Terrified mm. of giving a ball away, cuts back inside, everything slows down, and you go, here we go, we're going to recirculate it, or whatever they call it nowadays. Go back in and we start switching it about. And that, and the team you're playing against knows it's quite easy to stop you on the left on, on their left flank 
and that everything's going to come down their right flank. So everyone gets used to shuffling over and all that, you know. So that's how it kind of, that's how I kind of seen it. So he's obviously a, a really good player, you know, but obviously Angie's probably going to bring in one, one or two more players. So these guys who are coming on now will have more pressure. We're going to have maybe for the first time in living memory or ever, we'll have a culture at Tottenham where you've, you've genuinely got two players in every position vying for that position. You're always going to have a superstar of the team who cut like De Bruyne with City, those kind of players, Salah at Liverpool, who, you know, they're just out in the field of their own and you're always going to have that. But hopefully all that we'll have next season, we'll have a guy as good as Porro for right back and a guy as good as a Dogie at left back. We'll get into all of the match incidents. Craig, let's let's come to you. Um, I must say, every single game, um, I write down notes, obviously, for this podcast. And I wrote down probably the least amount in the opening 45 minutes today against Aston Villa. Um, two incidents for Spurs. 28 minutes gone. Madison to Son. Couldn't get there. Just a little bit uh, too close to the goalkeeper. And in the 43rd minute, Brennan Johnson crossed too close to the goalkeeper. Um I've got to say that it was quite a, a strange second half because neither team tested um, either goalkeeper. What did you make of that opening 45 minutes? Because even at half time, the people I spoke to, no one seemed very happy with that opening 45 minutes. No, it, it, it was very similar again to previous games that we've discussed on here before. It was, it was a lot of probing, a lot of possession. It was almost like we're trying to score the perfect goal and it, it was getting a bit um, not boring to watch, but it was like predictable, you know, for me. Um, you just, you're crying out, you're looking on, on X and like people are saying exactly the same thing because you think, you think, I can't be mad thinking this if everybody else is saying it. You know, you just want us to have a couple of shots. Uh, it's like we're trying to walk it in sometimes, but um Villa aren't Villa did seem to be sitting a bit deeper and just letting us have the ball, but we were pretty good in that first 10 15 minutes. We just couldn't have a shot, and I think if we was having having a few shots, then people would be a bit happier. But yeah, it's a bit strange whether it's a game plan or whether it's um, something that the, the players seem to just drift it into. I, I can't see that it is, but like I say, you just want to test the keeper have a couple of shots here and, um, you know, I have to say the away fans were superb all game. It's not like the fans switched off to it. it you know, we could, we could hear them, hear them on the telly. So it wasn't that, but he's it, it, getting a bit, um, I mean, I, I'm telling you, I'm moaning that we've won four nil. It's not that I'm just making a point that in that first half and the many other first halves, it's been, it's been the same to watch and the same issues have been there that we haven't had as many shots. We're trying to try to score the perfect goal. That's all. That's all I'd say on that. He's just. just I, I, I'd I love don't to see be, a few shots. I don't want to be negative or moaning. Certainly after we won four 0 but in that first half, it just seemed that we were moving the ball so slowly. And when you think of those opening ten games where we were sitting top of the league, and ball at its best, and even in pre-season, and constantly shouting to um, every single player forward and move the ball quicker and faster, and it just seems that. Defensively, we were moving the ball so slowly. Why do you think that has changed? I don't know. I really don't know. I really don't know. It's obviously something they're aware of because second half, we come out and we always play quicker, don't we? You know, everything's faster. It's like the thought process is a bit faster. It's almost like um, um, they don't want to make any mistakes in the first half. I don't mind when, because Romero holds onto the ball, almost stops it, stands and stands on the ball, waiting to lure the attacker in. And Villa weren't weren't doing that today. They were kind of quite happy for us to have it in some regards. And I think that's why it starts off slow. But it's like that first pass, that first pass, and then you go, you know, pass into the midfield, out to the wings, and then then it gets quicker. And like you say, in that first half, it was it was very very slow at points, and it obviously lets Villa reset. It lets them get his players back behind the ball. We're quite predictable, quite easy to to mark in essence. Um, so yeah, it's strange. But obviously, if we win four nil every match by doing that in the second half, let them get on with it. You know, I will take that every week. Um, so it's really, yeah, I know what you're saying. It's really difficult. Probably not much to discuss in the first half at all because all the action was in the second half. 
Absolutely. Um, Craig, uh, let me just ask you the same as uh, same question as Jar. Um, three qu- uh, three changes for Postacoglu in the starting eleven today. Um, it does seem to be very difficult for any of us to predict Andy's starting eleven at the moment. Any surprises there for you? Um, I, I was a bit surprised he went with Johnson, to be honest with you, over Werner. I, I, I thought Werner had played quite well the last few games, but perhaps just trying something different. Um, Johnson on the left, that surprised me actually, but obviously he doesn't seem to like Kulishevsky on the left, which is strange because, as uh, as Jar said, it slows down for me when Kulishevsky is on the left and he has to constantly cut back in on his left to cross the ball. It slows everything down. I didn't think Kulishevsky had um, one of his better games today. I know he set up one of the goals, but I thought uh, he, he was frustrating me at points. Um, but, you know, um, Ange obviously likes him and his work rate. So, um, you know, he stayed on for the whole 90 minutes, didn't he? So, um, so yeah, you can't question much when we've won 4-0, can you? That's the difficult thing. I know, I know there's, there's things that weren't quite right today, like we said about the first half and some players' performances, but it's really difficult to justify um, uh, being critical when you've won a game 4-0. All right, the sending off did help, which I know we're going to come on to. No. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. Look, I, I'm I'm happy today. There's not much to be um, critical about. But I think um, I think like I say, if we won four 0 every week, you know, <laughs> you can't moan. Absolutely, Simone. Let's come to you um, now. At half time, interestingly, we saw uh, Dragusin warming up. Um, a lot of the fans in the away end looked a bit confused, thinking, um, you know, surely he's not going to be taking Romero or Van der Ven off. Can you shed any light on that? Because, of course, inside the stadium, we don't get any information like that whatsoever. Um, was there an indication that one of them, or, or of course, Mickey van der Ven, ended up being subbed two minutes into the second half? Um, was, was there an injury that, that they were aware of just before halftime or at halftime to make that change because it was only two minutes in? We don't know. We didn't know what's, what, what happened at the in the in the adult time but uh, for sure definitely when when the second half started uh, Mickey van de Ven got injured and uh, with the international break around the corner after the Fulham game maybe it could be it could be it could be good because he will provide him uh, new new time to 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 be back uh, I'd like of course to underline uh, how uh, Radu Dragusin came into the pitch because in this couple of months he's been absolutely a great professional he has been waiting for his chance. Yeah, he took his chance. He played quite well. Of course, the best day in the back four was uh, Cuti Romero. Was uh, really a leader, not just in terms of not being booked, but uh, in the way he he, he he drove he drove the his, team, his teammates. So fantastic performance for uh, for everyone on the back four, and of course the game. To, the game at Villa Park showed once again the importance in the system of both the, the fullbacks, so Petro Porro and Destiny Doji. And I strongly think that uh, just like uh, the board, the Genge, Daniel Levy, and the sporting director decided to move to move to for for Radu Dragusin, the third the third choice be, behind uh, Romero and uh, and Van de Ven, uh, Spurs will need. A new, a new strong fullback in the summer because uh, we will play Europe. So double, uh, uh, double fixtures for week. So definitely, it's gonna be important to have uh, an important bench. Simone, from now until the end of the season, do you see Dragusin getting much game time um, in a Tottenham Hotspur shirt? Because when Romero and Van der Ven are both fit, how can you replace one of them? <laughs> Radu is there for is, is there for this reason. I, I don't think that uh, when both Cuti Romero and Miki Van de Ven uh, will be available, uh, Radu Ragusin will get much game time. Just like Bigench has been showing in this couple of uh, months. When uh, Miki went back, when Cuti went back, they were the were, were starters back four, two center backs. So that's that's all. I don't I don't know. I don't know. Let's see in the next couple of hours. Uh, how long it will take for Mickey to be back. John, let's come to you. Let's talk about Spurs' first goal in the 50th minute. Of course, uh, Saar assisting James Madison 
Uh, great to see Saar getting an assist and fantastic to see James Madison back on the score sheet. Uh, he ran over to the Aston Villa fans, give them uh, a great dart celebration again. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Uh, and I thought he did it just a little bit longer just to wind everybody up to get, you know, he did it. He did it. He, he didn't just do a couple. He, he, he did it over and over. He, mu he must have had 10 darts, I reckon. Oh, yeah, he was just really going for it. And, and it's great. So he should, you know, they, they all think they can get on to him and it, he's having the last laugh with it. But yeah, what a great goal. Great finish because he didn't go swinging it. He knew all he needed to do was to get the right angle. He didn't need to put any power on it. It's close range. But he made it look very easy. Um, the majority of footballers would put that over the bars. That it, 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 it would... It, it, it skew, all skew with it. Could go anywhere. But it's a lovely little controlled cushion volley wonderful bowling and a good ball I think from Kulu to to um to set to set Sar away, you know, but Sar is really like such a dark horse that boy, you know. Um because he's got he's got that skill and looks like he can come through in the big games. I've got to say this point though. I I found the first half frustrating, but sometimes as a football fan I want it every way. So if we started really up in the tempo in in that game in the first half too early and we push up a bit too high. Watkins goes through on goal in the uh, 44th minute to put on one up. I'm then saying that's typical Tottenham. We're terrible in Hoobling's first games. We can't hold our nerve. We can't keep our powder dry. You know? So, we did. So, I mean, I, I, I'm not criticising. That's me. That would tend to be my, you know, that would be one of the criticisms I would make about Ange Ball, that it's naive. Well, that wasn't naive today. They played as a team. They kind of manage the game. They're the away team. Um, and they're, they're like a boxer just jabbing away. They, they can't quite, you can see they're trying to move their feet and get in such a way. That, and that's it's, in that way, it's similar to boxing. You're just waiting till you start getting the feather a bit tired and you start knowing where he's going to put his head and, you know, you start firing shots um, where you know his head's going to be. And, you you know, that's and, and it changes in time. It's why fitness in all, all sports especially football, so important, you know. And so they, you know, Villa had to work very hard today, I think, in that first half, you know, covering. And we, we had most, most of the ball, they had to do most of the work off the ball. And as we know, that can get a bit tiring. And uh, and then when we struck, we really struck. We kind of acted as a whole team. We pushed up that little bit more and got in the front foot in a way we've seen quite a lot with Ange Ball, I think, in the, uh, uh, you know, in the first part of the season. You know, so I mean, oh, look, I'm I'm totally at times a typical mucky football fan. You know, I predicted at one point we'd end up second on your on your show, Chris. You know, and then, and then since then, I think you know we're going to blow this. We're not even going to get in the top six. Same old Tottenham. You know, away where I come away from that Everton game, two points thrown away, thinking we're not. You know, I'm fooling myself again. Yet another false dawn. You know, so now you know we got a kind of just. I think this guy's doing it, you know, has got them playing as a team, very aware. So one makes a run, someone else covers. They'll take responsibility. And there's something collectively in the team that, that felt they could they could just push up that little bit more, get on the front foot just that little bit more, take the game to Villa, which they did. And, you know, two quick goals, put them down on the deck. And like a boxer who's, who's had a knockdown, now he just knows, right, head on points, don't do anything silly. Nice and steady because I must admit, it's lovely watching a Tottenham game where you're not biting your nails right at the end. Yeah. You yeah. know, but I was annoyed we let them have two corners. I was annoyed we gave the ball away. We could have managed it a bit better because the, the team with, with 10 men shouldn't be getting corners even at that stage of the game. But whatever, we defended it. Vicario made a good stop, didn't they, from that boy at the, at the who stamped up, you know, fell on his head then. He stepped on his head by accident after, towards the end. But all good, you know. All good. Craig, let's come to you. Of course, Spurs doubled the lead on 53 minutes. Brennan Johnson um, getting another goal for Spurs. And, of course, going to mean Son with an assist. Um, I've got to say, up until that point, Son was quite quiet in the game. Um, but a great assist for Johnson. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. He did grow into the game, Son. You could see he was a bit frustrated in that first half. Um, I'm not quite sure when it was in the game, but he, um, I think, it, yeah, no, it was Kulisewski. It was definitely the second half. Kulisewski went on a run and 
Someone's in a great position. He just had to slide it between yeah. two defenders and Sonny punched the floor in frustration that he didn't pass to him. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it, I, the, that's the perfect word for that. He was just frustrated probably with lack of service and, and passes through to him, which you're going to get as a centre forward sometimes. Um, and that's why I do prefer Sonny on the left because he gets more of the ball and you want Sonny on the ball because he can make things happen or cut in and have a shot. Um, it's good, you're going to have games like that. Um, and we don't always play through the centre forward like like other teams do. It goes wide. So he, he's not going to see as much of the ball. Um, so, so as far as Son, I don't think it was as much his fault. I don't think he was having a bad game. I just I just think the ball wasn't coming to him and he'd been told to stay in a certain position as you, as you do generally as a centre forward. So, 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 yeah, but he grew into the game. Like you say, he got an assist and a goal. Um and like I say, it don't, don't really matter when, when that happens. But um, <clears throat> I think just having him on the pitch is a massive advantage sometimes, Sonny, because um, cause he's brilliant. So, so yeah, we'll let him off that one. I don't think he was man of the match. Like he got, he did get man of the match on the on the telly. But um, I, I think he grew into the game and he, and he had a good game in the end. So, so yeah, pure frustration for me. That's all that was. Well, Son with one goal. I made him right. I made him, I made him right, though. It was it was it was a ridiculous. He should he was in space. He's the kind of guy who could take the ball, get it out from under his feet, and and and, and hit the target, score a goal. I thought it was pretty pathetic than Kulovetsky. If I was Son, I would have been I would have been punching the floor as well. It was so I got to say that. Sorry to interrupt. Do you, mm. No, do you know, Joe? I think that's a really good point because I was going to bring that up um, during this podcast because I think so often, certainly e- even in today's game. Um, and Foster Coglu has said so often this season that the final third, we could really improve in that final third. And what, the amount of times that Kulosevsky and even Brennan Johnson, uh, in, in fairness, had a chance where he could have hit it first time and he took that extra touch and then it ended up being blocked. I think that that is, you know, it, in, in key games, I know we scored four today, but it could have been a lot more um, yeah. had, you know, certain players taken better decisions um, in the match. You can't Frank, have an o- you can't have an overload the way we did in that second half that ended up with Kudovetsky. All right, it was it was slightly wide the ball for him, so you could see why he didn't go with his weaker foot for goal, pulled it back for Son. But it's like, come on, I think we had five against three or something. Yeah, you, you've got to do better. You've got to end up at least end up with a sh- make the keeper make a save for God's sake, you know. And that's quite right, you know. They've got to get it in the head that th- this is ma- these kind of. When you're in the last third like that, it's manna from heaven. You don't waste it. You don't yeah. that, those opportunities, you know. And that's something that I guess will come with time, you know. That's what separates one of the big things in football separates like the Premier League and the Championship from lower leagues and non-league, you know. That the, the clinical finishing and the, the the taking of opportunities in regards to overloads. Um, and good chances and breakaways when you got when the defence are outnumbered. It's Sunday Park stuff when you got one chubby old centre half with four four geezers attacking him and it ends up with a ball being blasted over the bar. You know the complete lack of composure. You know so it's 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 about composure, keeping your head. All the all the stuff Ange, Ange would want is players playing with their heads up, being really aware and making those decisions in a nanosecond. Do I shoot? No, I pass. I just saw it with City there, you know, um, where the uh, guys had a shot when you got Fowd and a couple other people in better, probably better positions. You see, they're frustrated with it. That's elite level. You don't waste the ball. You not only just don't give the ball away cheap. You don't take silly shots, and you see that with lesser teams. You know, we've seen it with Tottenham this year when we're playing against teams defending really deep. Players shoot. And you can you know the shot's going to be blocked. So unless you're going to get lucky with a deflection, just recycle it. And to be fair, it's to do with patience. Sometimes the crowd doesn't help against Palace. It we, you know we we did what City have done for years, which is just play possession for keep playing, keep playing till the legs start to go, and you come through in that last ten minutes. You know, yeah. So it's proper football. It's skillful, skillful football. I know in regard, but I'm not even a massive boxing fan. But I suppose for some people, this can equate to Joe Bugner. You know, you 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 just play a safe game and you don't, you know. But it, it's sometimes you have to you have to have that. You have to have a bit of patience, you know, and smart defending, and you know, and and, and your tie tie teams out. That's that's 
if that's for the name of the game with possession football and high intensity pressing sort of game. You know, we can't we can't have it always and expect to return. There are those games where it will go. I mean, it, I'm looking at the, the City Liverpool game today. It's a, it's a battle. It's a battle. It's elite level football, and we're now touching on that. You know, which as as our Villa, but we're genuinely touching it on, on that because we've got. You know, you got. It looks like we've got a team that isn't. You, you can see the style of football that we play, where it can go. You know, so. But I, I, I I'm saying all this to myself because I can very quickly. I'm programmed. Typical Tottenham. We'll never get anywhere. You know, and it's another false stone. We've seen it year in, year out. You know. Um, it, it, it's a real positive though, Jar, isn't it? Because we we all know that there is, and of course, Ange knows. There is so much more to come from this Spurs team um, in all departments. So, in, and, and we're about to, or we could go in the top four and get Champions League football for next season. So, you know, progression wise, when you think of where we were a year ago to where we are now, there has been huge progression at the football club. And, and you know, a lot of that is down to Ange Postecoglou. And, and it's going to be, a t- as Simone said, it's going to be a tough April. It really is. Yeah, it's pr- yeah. gruesome. But if I'm Liverpool, City, Arsenal, especially Arsenal, I'm thinking, oh, I don't fancy playing that fucking lot. Right now, us, I mean, you know, I'd be thinking, oh, they're, they're coming good, you know, and I, I wouldn't fancy, I wouldn't fancy playing, because you know, you could, if we if we keep playing like this, they're going to have to be on the top of their game. And part of me prefers us playing the elite teams than the teams who get loads of men behind the ball. Yeah. You know, and yeah. That, I mean, Chelsea as well, we drew one. And I think, he, he, you know, I know they they like to think they got the hex on us and all that, but you never know with it. I mean, by the way, I don't think that Chelsea team's as bad as what people say. I think the midfield is really good there. If they had a proper striker, they'd probably be in the top six now. They sent them with so many chances. They're not the worst team I've ever seen. And I can see why he wants Gallagher, by the way. Gallagher, you know, not a thousand miles away from Saar, like the all action number eight, who can be a 10 and can be a six as well, you know, and all that caper. But, um, yeah, but, you know, I wouldn't fancy playing us at the moment. And in a way, I'd rather see us against these top teams because you know at times it's going to be toe-to-toe, you know, so and it might even suit us. Well, Spurs will uh, have a real say, I'm sure, in the title race uh, because, of course, we've got to play all three of those teams. Steve writes here, 39 consecutive games we've scored in, impressive. And, of course, we've scored in every single Premier League game under Ange Postecoglou. Um, let me just say, there is nearly 1,700 people watching live on YouTube right now. So if you don't subscribe to the channel, please do hit that subscribe button, like, share and put your comments below. And also a big thank you to everybody who's watched the channel in the last 30 days. Um, we were, um, by the official stats, uh, the most watched Tottenham Hotspur based YouTube channel on YouTube. So thank you so much. Um, Craig, let me come back to you. I just wanted to ask, with Hunmin Son playing through the middle, two assists today and a goal, which of course we'll get to, um, where where does Richarlison come back into this team? That's a really good point. Um, I'm not Richarlison's biggest fan. I never have been, but he's been playing well, uh, scoring goals over the last nine, ten games. But for me, um, I don't want to slag off Richarlison too much at all, if anything. But I think we can do better as a striker than Richarlison. Um, I don't think he's the answer um, going forward. That's what I'm trying to say. I think there's there's better out there we should be looking at. Um, I like him. I like him as a person. I like his work, eth- work ethic. I just don't think he's that clinical number nine that I still think we need because I don't think, think Son is a long-term answer up there. Um, I prefer to see Son on the left. Um, so, I mean, I mean, you know, whether they see Valiz as that, but there's some rumours that Valiz is happy in Spain and we might even might even sell him. I mean, that, that would be... Uh, I don't know if Simona has heard anything about that, about Valiz, but... You know that would be um, that wouldn't be good if we let him go in the summer. But um, if they don't see him fitting in long term, I can't see the point in holding on to him and loaning him out year after year, like we've done with Brian Kill and um, and others. So um, yeah, for for me, if I, I, I as I say, I think um, I like Richie, but I think we need a different number nine. I think I think we. We can have better options for us uh, going forward. So, but obviously he's here till the end of the season. 
he's he's a decent enough backup to centre forward, but um, I think Ange probably prefers Son up there, and Richarlison was a necessary thing to put put up there, person to uh, put put up there um, when we uh, when we needed to. So, so yeah, I don't know what the others think about Richarlison. It's a difficult one because I really like him, but I, I think there's better out there. Simone, do you want to answer that one? Well, uh, to be honest, uh, in the first half, I think that we needed uh, Richarlison uh, in terms of uh, coming back, playing uh, more more deep, low blocks. So I think that it was uh, uh, a game for him. Uh, then, in the long terms, uh, maybe a striker, a proper number nine. There are huge number nines that are growing up in Europe. There is uh, Victor Gioqueras in Sporting Lisbon, Cesco from Leipzig. Uh, the likes of uh, Santi Jimenez from Feyenoord, uh, another one that Tottenham have, have been uh, strongly linked to in the last couple of months. Uh, maybe, maybe yes, maybe yes. Uh, maybe Spurs could need uh, a proper number nine, someone that knows how to play inside the inside the box and was born to play in that kind of uh, in that kind of system. So we'll see. We'll see what's going to happen in the future. Simone, do you want to talk us through the uh, the red card on 65 minutes? John McGinn, straight red. Well, <laughs> the, the the games between Villa and Tottenham are, are always uh, are always battles. Not just uh, not just uh, for for Matty Cash in the last couple of seasons, but they are all uh, very very hard 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 games. Then, of course, the the sending off was key was key because uh, the sending off uh, factually uh, killed the game. Killed the game and Tottenham started to to, to play the ball, to 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 to, to manage the tempo and the, the pace and the rhythm of the game. Bigenge uh, uh, picked up uh, Betancourt in order to to add more quality in terms of possession, in the ball possession, and then, and then of course that the sending off completely changed the the game. Simone, of course, on 70 minutes, um, Papa Matasar went off. Benzenkur came on. Um, I put down uh, Sarah as my man of the match today. Um, it just seems week by week, month by month, Papa Matasar gets better and better and better, certainly under Ange Postacoglu. Um, he is a special player for Spurs, isn't he? He's a special player because he plays like uh, he's a, a veteran. He plays like uh, he's 30 years old and he's just uh, 20 years old. So he's a fantastic box-to-box -box midfielder. Really, really appreciated. No one knew him when... Paratici three years ago decided to, to to strike the deal a deal for this young uh, Senegal international player, but he has grown up a lot. Of course, in the evolution of the guy, there is uh, a lot of big edge for the goal. But remember uh, last season he played actually a very very good game with huge personality away at the San Siro, the last 16 of uh, UEFA Champions League, and this really impressed me a lot. He has got this huge legs. He go. He goes, he doesn't have any kind of fear. Box to box midfielder, uh, he's, he's, doing, uh, he's doing so well. He's doing so well. And this is the biggest problem that both Rodrigo Bentancur and Ives Bissuma uh, have. And it's a, a wonderful problem, a wonderful issue to, to have. And this is why, uh, before you were saying that it's difficult these times to predict the, the big edge ball, the big edge uh, lineup. John, let's come to you. On 75 minutes, this was the incident that we spoke about earlier. Kulisevsky shooting over the bar. Son looking disappointed that he didn't pass to him um, as he was running into the box. Um, just a minute later, Radu Dragusin um, blocked one that went out for a corner. And they actually showed the replay inside the ground. And uh, Dragusin went down. Um, it hit him right between the legs, which uh, it, was, it, it seemed like it was a sore one. What did you make of his performance today? Because, of course, it... It's nice, in a way, to see Dragusin play in a Spurs shirt because we haven't seen a lot of him. Yeah, I've I, I played a game a couple of years ago. I took one in the balls like that. Um, if that's all right. I mean, it's a fact, isn't it? It was like, you know. And uh, I, did, I didn't know what the right terminology oh, I mean, was it, there. I, I took it either real bad and right in the crown jewels. And uh, it's that delayed thing because you think, right, at the moment it happens, it's okay. I feel no pain, but you know what will come. And when it comes, it's a sharp end pain and a dull pain, and you just want to crawl away like an animal. When it's fucking, it's terrible. So and and, for, and I thought, look at him. 
he's getting up, he's getting on with it, you know, and that's, you know, fighting spirit. I'd just like to say quickly about Richard Carlison. Yeah. Because was number nine, and I know hey, he can be frustrating, but actually, in those kind of games, he can, he can come good. He, he Those games where everyone shit housing, he's a top shit houser, you know? And he'll get everyone at it. He has his part in, 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 in to play. And he's a great one to, a lot of the time, you know, in those tight games. I think he didn't play, did he, against Palace, I don't think. I think he was injured for that. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's kind of these games, you know, where you do get a few crosses in. He's a good one-touch finisher, you know. So it's another string to your Boeing games. Even City have got Haaland there. You know, even they know they can't walk it in the back of the net, game in, game out. So, you know, I know he is frustrating. I know sometimes he's got a terrible, you know, a very, he's a bit clumsy on occasion. But he's starting to score and I think he's got, he's definitely got his part to play in things, you know. And he, he gives us something no one else can do, you know. He can, you know, he can leave the line a bit. He, he really annoys defenders. Imagine playing with him. It, I'd start thinking how much he was annoying and I'd want to clump him. And that's great if you're getting people think that. Because he's a kind of bloke, he'd be annoying you, be he's in your ear and you think, you flash, I'll show you. And, you know, obviously then you're in trouble. So it, you want that. It, it, it's good. He winds everybody up, you know. So I quite like that. But, um, yeah, the thing with Kudovetsky, as you know, I said earlier, you know, we're still wasteful in that last third when we've got good opportunities. I've, it, I've seen it all season. So Ange is quite right. No, we... we just it, you, you've got to see it like it's manna for manna from heaven when you're bursting forward and you're outnumbering the defence. You've got to make it pay, you know. Joe, how, how how does Ange make that better? How does he improve that? Because it seems that we have spoken a lot about that, especially with Kulusevski, where players are in better positions where he could pass the ball. Um, you know, even Brennan Johnson. I was going to come on to this. Um, on 77 minutes, Kulusevski chance to cross. He didn't. Three minutes later, cross to Johnson. He decided to take the extra touch rather than hit it first time on the volley, which I think would have been a fantastic goal, by the way. But he decided to take the extra touch. Is that just the way that these players are? Or can Ange improve that so you know they look up and, and, and they make sure that they're making that pass to their teammate who is in a better position? It just seems really simple. Yeah, I know, but... Obviously, from us up in the stands, it always is. I do get that, you know. Um, but this is just by degrees, a football team gets better, you know. So, if if at this point they were absolutely killing teams, 6-0, 7-0, and taking all those opportunities, the way Arsenal are, for instance, at the moment, yeah. you know, they're sort of doing that. Um, I think we might all be a little bit surprised. You think, oh, it's only this bloke's first year. So, obviously, this comes with practice. I suspect that Angie's training sessions are very intense. They're very for real. I think that's why there's quite a lot of injuries because it's proper full contact. You know, they all really go for it. And I'm sure he'll be, I'm sure they'll have lots of training exercises, not just the strikers, but right through the team on making, they'll have all kinds of exercises because he comes on quite gruff and taciturn. But I think he's quite, um, He's quite a uh, intelligent guy, obviously, and he knows his football. And they'll be doing all kinds of all the, the latest modern exercises um, when you've got the ball and when you're overloading, you know, making sure you that, that, that you hit the target every time, that you, you don't waste those opportunities. It's so frustrating when you're breaking, and we've seen it a few times this season, and we've got four on two or four on three, and they still conspire and not even get a shot away. And a lot of it is because people are like, well, I don't really want to shoot. Maybe Sonny's the more senior guy. I'll try and get it to him. You know, and of course, it's just good decisions. Nanosecond decisions, whether you shoot yourself, whether you lay it off, you know. Um, you know, and of course, you get situations like, it's not exactly an overload situation, but the Porro goal in the cup against yeah. Burnley, where I'm actually, don't bloody scream! <laughs> <laughs> Picks it up in the top corner, so such is football, you know. Um, and he's actually one guy who I'd like to see shoot a bit more because when he, it was for Sporting he played for, wasn't it? Sporting Lisbon, I think, was his team, the one in green and white. You, I saw, I remember seeing all his YouTube hitting the top corner all the time, chips and blockbusters, you know. Um, great, really great, accurate striker of a ball. So I'd like a bit more long range shooting from 
from him, you know. But yeah, it will just cut. I guess this is just work, work, work. And whatever Ange talks, his answer, like all the good coaches, is getting that they back themselves to coach the players out on the training pitch. So I think that's kind of where we're, we're you know, it will, it, it will only improve, you know. Craig, let's come to you. Let's talk about Andrew's subs today. Um, because on 87 minutes, Madison and Johnson went off. Timo Werner and Hoybier coming on. Um, of course, Timo Werner ended up getting uh, Spurs' fourth goal, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, Jay writes here, um, I want to hear from you on the podcast, shall we sign Timo Werner on a permanent deal? Now, I just feel myself, this is my personal opinion, I think that every single... Uh, week that goes by, every game that goes by, Timo Werner, we're getting that little bit more out of him. Of course, Ange said that we would never have been in a position to sign him in the first place had he have been performing consistently well and playing well for RB Leipzig. At £15 million in the summer, you know, for an option to buy, it seems a very, very decent deal uh, for a player that we know can play on the right, on the left, through the middle, can assist, can score. It's a no-brainer, isn't it? He is, I was going to say those exact words. It's a no-brainer. We've got to sign Werner in the summer if there's 15 million is, is, the, is the fee which we're led to believe. Um, absolute no-brainer. He's growing into this team. I didn't think he started off particularly uh, badly when, when we played at Man U. He, he, you could see he was just easing himself into the game, didn't want to take players on, but he seems to be doing that now. He's getting himself in, in the right positions. He's got his confidence up with a couple of goals now. Great finish today. Um, for me, absolute no-brainer. If you, and if you want to obviously sign for Spurs, which I think uh, permanently, which which um, which I think he does, I think he's enjoying it. Then you just got to go and get him. Um, and for me, just going on the other sub there, Hoybier, I thought he was really good when he came on again today. I know he was only on for about five, five ten minutes, but he, he he intercepted a couple of times. He he done a bit of a pirouette and then drove forward with the ball. Uh, played some good balls through. Amazing, amazing performances as sub this season, Hoybier. So you could argue, do you want to keep Hoybier around as a squad player? But I don't think he wants to be a squad player. He's not at that point in his career yet, which is a shame because I think he he could add some value to this squad. But um, the subs were good today. But it was a bit easier today, wasn't it? Because we was in a lot more commanding position. It's got to be said, though, as well, that with Pierre Hoybier, you know, a lot of people can't, could sulk about not playing, but he has been extremely professional every single time and putting a shift in whenever Ange has called upon him. Um, yeah. Samo, let's come to you. Let's talk about um, Tottenham's third goal, Hunmin Son. It seemed to, you know, when when you want these big games, you know, we want the win, you want to put games to bed. We've certainly done that. Yeah. The third goal was the first uh, great great play by, by Dajak Kruzewski. The only one that... I didn't I didn't like today was Dejan Dejan Kulusevski. So I agree on what Craig was uh, was saying before. Uh, answering also on Timo Werner's situation uh, for 50 million pounds could be absolutely a bargain. Could be a top squad player. Squad player. Uh, uh, I would lo I would have loved to see uh, Timo today uh, coming on maybe 10 minutes before uh, stuff like that. So uh, the trainer, the third goal was uh, was great, was great with a classic Sony shoot, three, three nil, and the game the game was already was already finished, game to bat. Simone, going on to talk about the uh, the fourth goal, of course, Timo Werner in the ninety fourth minute. That will do him the world of confidence, won't it? Because even talking to a couple of fans before the game. Uh, when the team came out and Timo Werner was not in the starting eleven, a couple of guys said to me, that won't be very good for his confidence. But coming off the bench, getting uh, getting an assist today, getting a goal, that will certainly do his confidence the world of good. Yeah, definitely. It's all about confidence when we talk about Timo. Timo needs confidence. Uh, Timo needs goal, needs assist. Need, need, he needed game time when he came to the club in January. And today, to be honest, uh, I'm going to underline uh, this aspect. Uh, I would let him come on, coming on uh, a little bit before, a little bit, maybe 10 minutes before, because to, to nil, you need to kill game, the game. You need to, to, you can exploit spaces. You can attack the spaces. 
so Timo was perfect in that kind of uh, situation in the game. So the line that, that in um, in ten minutes he managed to score the the fourth goal, and and then the way and uh, gave him the the ovation that uh, that he deserved. George, do you want to give any input on Tottenham's third and fourth goals? Of course, uh, Hun Min Son and Timo Werner, because Sonny, he always, whenever, whenever he seems to have a chance, he always delivers for us. Yeah, he's a good finisher. I think I've seen him, imp- we've all seen him improve over the years because I remember him missing a few. Do you remember that yeah. first season? It was looking, he weren't happy. Yeah. And now, obviously, he's a mainstay for us, you know. And with Werner, yeah, I, 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 I don't think Werner's confidence would have dropped before the game because they know they know the score. He he done he was I think he was our man of the match against Palace actually. I thought he was really, really good. You know, he, he obviously he missed that one on one. He went through him, you knew he all day long he's gonna fluff it. The point come, shoot, now nah, missed it, gone. You know, he tries to go wide and all that. But he played very well and he scored a goal, which was great. But as I said earlier, I think the reason he'd know the reason why. Firstly, it's gonna be Kudovesi first name on the team sheet, I suspect, with Ange, right? I'd love to know from him um, why, you know, but he obviously does. And I'm not, I'm not critical of it. And obviously really, really rates him and just thinks, you know, he's, it, it's a one, one, by the way, city Liverpool. I shouldn't, I shouldn't keep saying that, but you know, uh, penalty keeper, unbelievable. Took Nunes down. Unbelievable. Come running out uh, to clear the ball and caught him clear pen. I mean, madness and a bad ball back to him, but, Fine margins when you're playing out the back. Anyway, where was I? Um, what was I talking about? Oh, Kudovesky. So Kudu's obviously the first name on the sheet, and absolutely loves him, doesn't sub him. He, he's obviously got that thing, he trusts him for some reason 100%. So you've got one other winger position. And Johnson, I guess today, he thought he'd be a little bit more direct. Um, his style of play, you know, c- coming inside, really attacking the guy. And I think Ange just fought with Matty Cash go for him, actually go at him. Whereas Werner's a guy more to get to the byline and get it back. I'm not saying Johnson can't do that, but that's more when he plays on the right. So I think he's just thought target cash a little bit with Johnson going one-on-one on on him all the time, taking him on, you know? So it's all part of the game plan. And it's it's a squad game. So I don't think Werner would have felt, you know, he comes on and that's exactly when you'd expect him to come on second half when the game's a bit stretched. And I think it's a no-brainer for him. He's experienced, yet he's young. It's a good price, you know. Um, it's it's a good deal. So I, I would hope that he stays. And by the way, that interlink for that fourth goal with him and Son, I mean, very, very clever play with Son. And the finish made it look easy, Werner. Knew it had a picture in his head before he hit the ball. Very, very good play. I'm glad you brought that up because um, I think the link play between Son and the likes of Johnson and Timo Werner is improving week by week. And I think that's going to get better and better as well. Um, Craig, very quick question for you. Vandal Ross writes here, if we had Harry Kane, we'd be in a title race. Agree or disagree? I can't disagree with that because I think Kane would be banging in the goals in this system. And um, when we was talking, well, when I was talking about earlier about having a centre forward, I think Kane would thrive in this team. And as I've said before, I wonder if there is a little bit of him that regrets going to Germany. I know he's absolutely banging in the goals in Germany. Uh, but, you know, Tottenham's his club, let's face it. Um, and like many before him, felt he needed to go elsewhere to win trophies. Yeah. But I just wonder if he had given Ange another, a season, um, would he have signed a new contract by now? Um and would we be higher up the table? I'm convinced we would. How can you be a worse team with with Harry Kane in the team? I just can't see it. I, I, I just I think we might have played slightly differently, but having that focal point, having that spearhead, um, I, 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 I can't see how we would have been any lower down the table, to be honest. Um, yeah, it's no, that's a no no brainer for me. We would be better off with Kane in this team. However, we're doing well. And we've done well without him. Um, and it's amazing not many people actually talk about that. And that, that, that's kind of testament to Ange and all the players and the squad that we're building. That Although, obviously, we may, we always mention Harry Kane on this channel now and then, but when not many people are saying, oh, we really, really miss Harry Kane. Um, 
is testament to what Angie's building. Craig, we've spoken about most players today. Um, I think there's two players that we haven't really mentioned. Vicario didn't have a lot to do because, of course, Villa only had one shot on target. Um, Basuma is the other one that we haven't spoken an awful lot about. What did you make of his performance today? I thought he just went about his business um, in a quiet way and um, didn't do much wrong um, and just had a pretty steady game, to be honest, Basuma. Um, he probably would have found it fairly easy today. He didn't have to lunge in or or do anything extravagant. He just did his job. Um, didn't stand out for being exceptional or terrible today. And I, th I think that's, that's kind of testament to the to the type of game he had. You know, it's not a bad thing. I thought he had a, a reasonable game, Bissouma. Um, just did his job in front of the back four, and that was it, pretty much. There's two other things that we're going to cover now in this podcast. Um, just to talk about the price increase for season tickets for next season and of course we will preview uh, the Fulham away game and, and our next Premier League game uh, which of course takes place next weekend Joe I'm going to come to you on this because of course I know you're a season ticket holder um, Spurs have increased the season tickets by 6% uh, the supporters trust are uh, very unhappy by this decision are, are, you know, as are a lot of fans um, and they are asking fans to email in the club uh, stating uh, that supporters are unhappy and, and why has this been the case. What are your thoughts on the um, the ticket increase? Don't get me started. Don't get me started. I'm an, I'm, I'm an OAP now. Oh, I'm getting old. Right, 65, so a qualified route. Discount now. Well, I couldn't get one because we don't, we, we've run out of an allocation in where you are. So I moved, as I understand it, you can't move. You can't see where there's. You could get one. You have to. Yeah. So you have to move to another area, hoping that they want to reach the full allocation of OAP tickets. And of course, I moved again. And guess what? They didn't have one. You know. Um, so I'm going to phone them and try again. I think it's really, really poor. And just at a time when it, a lot of people were against Levy, as we all know, and. Um, it had got to the point where he'd won back with the appointment of Ange and the excitement levels. He'd won back a lot of popularity, you know. And then it's just it's just such a, a short-sighted, you know. If you get the calculator out and work out the percentage, I wonder of OAPs, you know, um, you know exactly how much you, you, you would be losing in compared to you know full price tickets. It really is pathetic. And I don't know of any other club anyway, before they talked about this phasing out quality, I don't know of any club that didn't just give everybody, once they reach a certain age, a discount. It was already a season ticket holder, you know, or, be or even if you become at 65, you manage to get an hold of a season ticket that you then get this. It's really poor. And of course, the message is we only really care about profit. No matter what we say, actually, all we really care about is profit. That's that's what it says, obviously. It's really, really badly thought out. And you do wonder at times with Daniel Levy, you know, I thought this a lot of times over the years, is there anyone around him who can really get his attention and say, don't do this, Daniel. It's not a good idea, you know, because it just makes you think, well, I don't know, at some point, you know, you just have to switch. If you're that disrespected, at some point you just switch off. You know, and you, you, you know, you just go and watch non non league football or whatever. Do you know what I mean? You know, um, so yeah, I think it's a, a, a comms disaster, a PR disaster, really doing it. You know, and it just it make it just assures it 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 it, it makes sure that there's a, a large body of fans who are just permanently not happy with the club. You know, and you could you could just you just think for the sake of it, you know. You could put the the prices up a bit anyway, maybe you know, but doing that rub compounding it, you know, in that way is really really poor, you know, and uh, and misses a trick just just when he'd got everybody back on side. Well done, you know. That's my view. Yeah. If if anyone wants any more information about um, the season ticket um, increases, um, please do visit the. Uh, the official Tottenham Hotspur Supporters Trust website, and I know that they are talking to the club about it and about everyone being unhappy with the uh, the increases. So best of luck to them. 
uh, with their meetings with the club and, of course, the fan advisory board as well. Um, Craig, have you got anything to add about the season ticket price increase or should we just go straight to Fulham? Um, no, I mean, I'm, I'm, I can't even get a ticket even though I'm a member half the time. So that shows what the popularity of the club is. And I think that's key in that the club knows um, how many people want tickets. I mean, if that stadium was a 100,000 seat stadium, they'd sell it out every week at the moment because we're doing well. And, and, and that's that. And they're still getting money from the members anyway. You pay a privilege. Um, so you pay 35, 45 quid a season for the privilege of not being able to buy a ticket, um, which, which is crazy because obviously members can be anywhere over the world, which is fine. Um, and it could be that somebody in another country has more chance of getting tickets than somebody in, in England, like myself, you know, uh, and that's what the club want. Um, I've got no problem with, with, with anyone trying to get a ticket. But like Jar said, you just want it to be fair, really. And I think he's spot on that the goodwill he's won back or the club's won back uh, from people this season, they're kind of dented that. Um, I haven't got a problem with the club putting tickets up, prices up, by the way, 1.5%, because that's what it actually equates to over the last few years. They put it up six, and that sounds like a jump, massive jump, which it is but it actually equates to 1.5% a season. Um, but what the, the concessions for the OAPs um, is not right in my book, absolutely not right, because there's a huge proportion of the fan base you've pissed off there, and and, the, and obviously the people that feel the pain of those uh, people. So uh, they, they didn't need to do it. As I say, I haven't got problems with things going up. Everything's going up. Um, the people say they shouldn't raise the ticket prices because we've got high prices anyway. Fulham have got higher prices, Arsenal got higher prices, a lot of clubs have, especially in London. Haven't got a problem with it going up a little bit, I get that, but this jump is going to is gonna fill the pinch for some supporters and they won't be able to afford going to football. And that, that, that's the thing for me, it would be incredibly sad if you're of a certain age and you've supported this club for years and years and years and you've had a season ticket for years and years and years and then all of a sudden you're not going to be out going perhaps go to the place that is your happy place that's what you've done all your life you know you might be living on your own and Tottenham is your life and now you can no longer afford to go and that for me is sad um but yeah the club do what the club do and we score many own goals don't we I mean I do wonder with this as well you know if there's some kind of you know algorithm at play where where these old sods you don't we don't make enough money from them so you know we know we've got them anyway. We know we've got all the loyal support that goes in the South Stand. But with a the demographic, they're not going to be there forever, maybe. We don't make as much money from them as we can from other other areas. Maybe people flying in from abroad. And may, maybe the time's coming where a club like Tottenham thinks we don't need that as many season ticket holders. If it's a premium product, we can just sell it. as a, We can auction the tickets or something, you know, every month or whatever, you know. We can really we we can improve our yield by another twenty two point seven percent or something. You know, it's all kind of business stuff, and you know the way it comes across with the OP stuff. It's all it's all it's all in the in the small print somehow. It's it's not an honour. It's for me not an honourable way to treat your um, Nunes just Mister Blinding Chance. By the way, uh, Diaz Diaz Mister Blinding Chance through on goal. Um, so even, even the best of them, if it's us, we'd all be moaning, you know. But yeah, it's to me, it's all in the small print. It's a bit, it's not, out, it's not for me. It's not an honourable way to treat your um, your supporters. It just means you see your, your people like ourselves as commodities at the end of the day. That's a shame, you know. I feel like we could talk about this subject at length. So I think we will perhaps record a, a midweek podcast and and go um, in on this in detail. Um, rather than on this particular edition. Well, it's quite um, complicated. I mean, I felt yeah. when I first looked at it, it's like, oh, God, it, it's a bit like, it's like when you're hiring a car in, you know, in, in the Mediterranean, you know, and, the, and you're looking at the small print, you think, what does that mean? Like, you know, exactly, you know. Does that mean yeah. I'm buying a car or something at the end of it? You know, it's, um, it's quite, you know, I found it difficult to sort of understand all the internet, except obviously, you know, you once you've read it through a couple of times, you get, you you get the gist of it, but it's it's kind of quite. I felt quite mealy mouthed sort of way of putting it. You know, we love the club. Just have a bit of 
just have a bit of bloody respect for us. Come on, come yeah. on, you yeah. know. I thought I thought it was a big shame, but I, I completely agree and uh, and understand why they did it. Tottenham Hotspur uh, flags have decided not to now do the tifo for the Manchester City game um, because of this increase. But as I said, I, I, I think that, that we could talk about this at length. So we'll we'll do a midweek podcast covering uh, this subject. Um, last question for you all, um, because. I will be travelling back to London very shortly from Birmingham. It is absolutely pouring down here. Um, Craig, let's come to you first. Next up, Fulham away, Craven Cottage. Next weekend, of course, uh, they lost away at Wolves 2-1 on Saturday. Fulham are currently 12th in the Premier League table. They've played 28. Uh, They've won 10. They've drawn 5. They've lost 13. Uh, Minus 4 goal difference, 35 points. They're now 18 points behind us. In 2024, they have played seven Premier League games, winning three, losing three, drawing one. Very inconsistent. They won away at Manchester United 2-1. They beat Brighton uh, 3-0 at home. Uh, But as I said, they lost to Wolves on Saturday. What do you think Spurs uh, will do next week at Craven Cottage? Are you confident that Spurs can go there and pick up the three points? Yeah, as you say, very inconsistent. Uh, for me, um, we should be going there and beating Fulham. However, um, I think uh, we always tend to struggle against Fulham at Craven Cottage. It's, it's, it's not an easy place for us to go. I can remember a lot of tight games, two ones, that sort of thing, last minute goals. But it's another must win game. Let's face it, we can't be beating Villa and then going to lose to Fulham. That's the most important thing. We've got to keep the momentum up and got to keep going because, as we said, we've got a tough April. So we get through these games. Um, let's get Fulham done and out the way. Um, as I say, massive game. Um, who's sorry? Who did you say Villa have got, Chris, at the weekend? West Ham away. West Ham away. That's it. Yeah. So look, obviously West Ham lost today, did they? I think. Um, Another team that blows hot and cold, but you never know what you're going to get from West Ham. It's not going to be an easy game for Villa. So, who knows? Who knows? We might even be ahead of them next weekend, hopefully. We can, but hope. But, yeah, another uh, tough game, but one we should definitely be looking to win. I totally agree with Andy's score prediction there. It's exactly what I was going to say. I'm going to go for 2-0 Tottenham win. Simone, do you think that Ange Postecoglou will change anything in terms of the starting eleven for next week against Fulham? And what I don't think. I don't think the lineup will be uh, up. I think. I, I think the same. It's important for this uh, very very young group of players that they don't feel like after today, after this uh, huge win, they they act like uh, as. As if they won the, the World Cup, they have to be consistent. They have to go there and win the game. I know. I absolutely share uh, the truths of Craig. Uh, Craven Cottage is not an easy place to go, but if you want to finish fourth, if you want to aim to finish in fourth, you have to go there and win the game. It's a must-win game. And score prediction, Simone? Two-one for Tottenham. Joe, what are you thinking? Oh, well, I've got it because I had a ticket for it, and I'm. And then they've moved the kick off, and they said, I'm playing Brighton with my sons. I'm sitting in with a show and agreed to do it. So I'm going to miss it. And that's my favourite away game of the year, mate. Fulham away. Walk through Bishop's Park and all that. It's my manner in London now, all sort of Chelsea around there. You know, I'm out the East End, but I'm, I'm back when I'm in London a lot of the time, based over there. And um, I, I run a, I help run a community thing, charity thing in South London. Well done, you two. I've just realised all this Peterborough art. Well done for the sleeping out thing, by the way. You know, well done. You. I wonder why you would fight, Craig. Right now, I yeah. not sleeping in doorways. Bloody hell! But um, so anyway, I, I went to the Fulham away in the League Cup, that uh, the Milk Cup, whatever you call it, Caribou earlier this year. weren't happy with that. So many Spurs fans there reminded me of the seventies. We had all that end. I was in with the Fulham fans. I had a nice, nice seat halfway down, and uh, and yes, I'm gutted. I'm not going. Um, but I'll be watching it on the on my phone before we go on stage, I suppose. Um, I hope we see games. Um, and as I say, that's my favourite away game. We're going to win 3-1, I think. We have to beat them. But look look what happened in the League Cup. We played a weak team. But that Polina is he's a monster in midfield. And on their day, as we've seen away at United, they can do damage. And he's a canny manager. So no chances. But Tottenham are a better team than Fulham. 
man for man, all over the pitch, no excuses. You've got to be winning there. And I think we'll win it. I'm going to say 3-1. Well, there certainly won't be 10 changes for next week's game against Fulham, Jar. so we've got a chance. I'm going to, I'm yeah. going to go for a 2-0 Spurs win. And uh, a few people have said during this stream, Craig, why is Craig looking so miserable and we've won 4-0? And I think it's, pro it's probably because we spent that night in Peterborough and didn't get much sleep. It is exactly that, yeah. Um, I keep looking at myself on the screen thinking, Christ, you miserable sod. And it is because I'm, absolute, I'm absolutely knackered. Obviously, we got a couple of hours sleep Friday night and I did try and have a kip yesterday afternoon but you, you know you just don't sleep properly in the afternoon um, at a late night last night as well up early this morning so I'm absolutely exhausted so I'm sorry if I look miserable but Chrissy snoring kept me awake all night Friday that's, that's my excuse but uh, yeah lovely to be back on anyway Chris um, I think I'm hosting next week uh, in Chris's absence, if, we're still, if that's still going ahead. So you're going to have to suffer me. I'll try and be in a better mood next week. I promise. I promise I'll smile more. But lovely to be on. Uh, looking forward to catching the end of the Liverpool City game because we want one of those to get a result. We want one of those to win. So Arsenal, looking like, top, looking so come like on, either. It's going to be a yeah. draw at the moment, Craig. The result, we really don't. Disaster. Yeah. Disaster. Disaster. Yeah. But yeah, thanks for having me on, everyone. And I'll try and smile a bit more next week. Thank you, Craig. Thanks as always. And Simone, thanks so much for coming back, talking about um, a, a great 4-0 win today. Where can people find you and what you're up to at the moment? Yeah, of course, uh, as always, guys, on Instagram, Simone Doc Duluamo 21 So whenever you wish, I'm, I'm, always, uh, I'm always there, guys. Go on, you spurts. Thank you, Simone. Pleasure to have you here. And Jar, thanks so much for coming back. Uh, we've got to do this one-to-one uh, at some point talking about your career and talking about your love for Spurs we'll do that at some point in the future um, but you've got a new book coming out so tell everyone about that Our Dark Luminosity it's an ex big expanded version of a book I've done a few years ago called Memoirs of a Giza which was a pun on Memoirs of a Geisha that was out all the way back then so that's come out on Fabers <laughs> that's an audible book as well and I've got um, shows I'm doing a lot of book events with that in, in the forthcoming weeks and then touring again in, in April through the year over to America. I only do it in the close season, so I can still see Tottenham, you know, uh, pathetically. But so, yes, yeah, so I'm just at it still. And uh, always always got time for you, though, Chris. And like I say, yeah, again, people should check out this charity you and Craig were involved in, right? Sleeping Rough, obviously, looking at the issue of rough sleeping. So yeah. people should check out what exactly what it is. I'm going to be checking out exactly what you, the charity is. And, well... Well done to both of you, by the way. That stuff. Thanks, mate. My, my, my thing I do, the thing in London, Tuesday, that's closer to Mark than anything else because it's real. And, you know, it's a, it's, a wonder, it, it's a wonderful thing you're both doing. Thanks so much for mentioning that, Jar. And if, if anyone didn't know, me and Craig actually slept rough at Peterborough United Football Club on Friday evening. Um, it's all in aid of the Light Project Peterborough. They do some absolutely fantastic work. Uh, I will put all of the links and details um, below. So if you would like to donate to this wonderful charity, please do so. Uh, but thanks so much for joining us for this evening's podcast, talking about Tottenham's 4-0 win at Villa Park. And uh, let's hopefully uh, talk about another win next week against Fulham. Craig, Jar, Simone, thanks so much for your time. And until the next one, come on, you Spurs. Come on, you Spurs.